Awesome. Greetings, everyone. Bienvenidos. Welcome to the second and last day of the New York City Latinx Gay, Bi, and Trans Men's Health Rally. Uh, antes de empezar, voy a hacer un comunicado en español. Uh, queríamos recordarles a todos nuestros participantes que prefieren escuchar esta sesión en español, que tenemos servicios de interpretación disponibles. Lo único que tienen que hacer es, es irse al menú de Zoom y en el... Uh, en, en el mundito que dice interpretación, apretar y escoger el lenguaje que ustedes prefieren uh, escuchar. Uh, again, uh, welcome to the uh, Latino Gay, Bi, and Trans Men's Health Rally. Uh, it's our second day today, uh, second and last. And today's topic is going to be about activating community resilience and mentorship uh, in our communities. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce the panel. Uh, in this panel, we will be addressing uh, ways to activate and cultivate uh, resilience in the community uh, through intergenerational mentorship, as well as capacity building. Uh, and also we will address some of the challenges and barriers uh, affecting emerging new leaders. Uh, I am very, very honored to be joined by our panelists today, uh, Leandro and Ash. Uh, I will introduce them both individually right now. Uh, Leandro Rodriguez. Hi, Leandro. How are you? Uh, so Leandro is the Vice President of Programs at the Latino Commission on AIDS. Uh, Leandro was born and raised in Fajardo, Puerto Rico. He has dedicated 25 years of LGBT uh, to the LGBT uh, issues as well as HIV prevention. Uh, he obtained a sociology BA from the University of Puerto Rico and a master's in business administration from the University of Phoenix. Uh, in his 25 uh, years experience in the field, Leandro has developed in areas such as capacity building, uh, grant writing, uh, program design, implementation and evaluation, as well as uh, transformational leadership, organizational coaching, curricular writing, as well as uh, motivational speaking. Uh, Leandro also works as a pri private consultant in the areas mentioned above, and Leandro's population of interest include communities of color, women, uh, substance users, and Latinx LGBT communities. Currently, Leandro is the Vice President of Programs, as I mentioned, uh, for the Latino Commission on AIDS, uh, which includes the OASIS LGBT Wellness Center in New York City. Uh, he is also part of the Population Committee on the Na uh, New York State HIV and AIDS Advisory Board. Uh, Leandro is also a 2018 graduate of the UCLA Anderson School of Management Leadership Executive Program. Uh, Leandro, we are very, very glad to have you here with us today. Uh, and our second panelist is Ash Tebar. Hi, Ash, how are you doing? <laughs> so Ash is a youth counselor for the Transgender Housing Program at Ali Forney Center, here located in New York City as well. He is a recent graduate in recreation education with concentration in therapeutic recreation uh, from the CUNY uh, Lehman College. He is also currently in his first year of his master's degree, focusing on disability studies at the School of Professional Studies, also at CUNY. Uh, when he isn't working hard in the Big Apple, you can also find him in his leadership role with Harbor Camps, a nonprofit organization that offers underserved communities a chance to enjoy summer camp, including transgender youth eight to 15 years of age. Uh, his primary role supporting staff, is supporting staff as well as teaching new archery instructors. Um, 
In addition, he established a BIPOC affinity group for staff uh, that meets weekly during summer session and a BIPOC club uh, for campers uh, once a session. Uh, we are also very glad to have you with us, Ash. Um, before we start, um, I really want to, you know, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we will be talking about mostly about activating community resilience and mentorship. And we will focus it a lot on intergenerational mentorship. Um, so my question for both of you will be first, at least to give, you know, some, some baseline or really to create some of the foundations for the conversation that we're gonna be having today. What is it that you understand based on your experience uh, by community resilience? What is it that you um, believe community resilience is? Uh, I want to start with Leandro first. Thank you, Fran. Thank you for the invitation and, and congratulations on your second day of, of the rally. Um, I heard yesterday went really, really well. Um, I think, you know, thinking of this question, I, I like to approach, uh, approach it from two angles. First, from, from the definition perspective, because it's, you know, my, my nerve mind works that way. And then from a storytelling perspective. So when you look at community resilience and what does that mean? First of all, there's different models of community resilience out there. And I think it's interesting that there, there's docu documentation and research based on different types of model for different types of community. But I think one definition that stuck with for me, uh, which kind of like makes sense and then I, I, I'm, I'm aligned to is the definition of the sustainability of a community to respond to, withstand and recover from an adverse situation. And as, as you go deeper into what that means, you, you know that there's, a, you know, from the different models, there's like six foundations that I found um, are kind of like similar in all of the model, models. And number one is people, people, because communities are based, you know, are composed of people. System thinking, which I think is very interesting. And now that you mentioned, you know, that this, when I focus the conversation in intergenerations, I think it's important to understand what system thinking is. Um, adaptability, transformability, sustainability, and then my, my favorite one is courage. And as, as we look at the different models, there's an example that I want to highlight, uh, and it's based out of a Seattle Times um, article that was published in 2017 after the Pulse incident in 2016. And that article by the Seattle Times, uh, well, the title of the article was trauma haunts the LGBT community, but resilience define it. And I think, you know, I want to use the pulse as an example, but if you look at our movement from, from when we started, uh, we've always been um, haunted by trauma, haunted by oppression, haunted by homophobia, haunted by transphobia, haunted by different systems of, of oppression, but it is our resilience that have kept us moving. It is our resilience that have kept us evolving, changing, adapting, advocating, marching, um, dancing, loving, um, you know, and all of those things that, you know, probably I can say in Zoom, um, <laughs> but, you know, but, but it, is, it is that capacity that we have had that, you know, others, others community might, might felt or might feel shut down. And while certain, certain parts of our community do feel shut down and they pay the price for it as a community, we've, we have been able to adapt. We have been able to respond. We have been able to kind of like understand where it is that we need to infiltrate. So we ha you have seen us infiltrated in, infiltrated in politics, in pop culture, in media. So because part of our resilience is to educate people and to make sure that people understand that we are not a threat. We are not uh, this plague that is going to take away values. In fact, we encourage values and we, we highlight that. But we also want to be, you know, we want to be seen, we want to be accepted, and we want to be loved. So for me, resilience is having all of those ingredients um, together to make sure that we continue to evolve as a movement, continue to evolve as a community, and, and continue to be visible for our rights. Thank you, thank you, Leandro, for that answer. Because uh, you know, you you mentioned definitely the adaptability, and thank you for bringing up also polls as well. You know, it's definitely always um, good to remember what is it that those systems of oppression have done to our communities, but also what is it that we did after, like you mentioned. You know, we adapted, we got up, we stood up, 
um, and we continued moving forward, um, which is is a great, great definition of community resilience. Uh, I want to uh, hear now from Ash, but I also want to encourage all of the participants who are joining us to also drop your names as well as your affiliations on the chat. Uh, to let us know where is it that you're joining us from. And also to remember that, you know, this is a conversation between all of our panelists, but also between you guys. So also uh, give us your opinions on the chat um, and also all the questions that you might have. Um, so Ash, uh, what is it that you understand by community resilience? Uh, I'm trying to think of what else can I say after uh, Leandro's like elo eloquent um, explanation of it. Um, I think, for me, when I hear resilience, I like to simplify things as much as possible. And resilience means you get back up because an obstacle has occurred and it might have knocked you down. Um, but in that process of getting back up, you, I think we forget a lot of times the healing that needs to happen before we can continue to move forward. So if we, um, you know, if we look at Stonewall in 1969, when that happened, it wasn't really that too long ago, but they did regroup, um, take the time to, uh, you know, channel and focus and build, start building the community uh, a little bit better to fight um, because there was a lot of like trans women in the forefront who were doing it and they needed, you know, they needed the backup and the support. Um, and then I, I think in there, that's where that rest came, where it was like, kind of like a changing of the guards. It was like, okay, you you started this, you pushed it, and now you need to rest and like recuperate, plan, whatever that means. And um, we're gonna be upfront and whether that was, you know, through uh, policies and procedures that were trying to be changed in government. Um, and then now look at Stonewall now where it's not, you know, a shady, uh, mafia related bar it's owned <laughs> by lgbt and it's lgbt everything and it's it's a happy place to go um so i for me for that res resilience is getting back up but then healing and kind of learning um to make sure you get back up better um because i feel like with with activism and our our community is great and we're such social justice warriors but we can often really get burnt out and kind of like run ourselves ragged and dried that I've seen great professionals just leave. They don't want to do this work anymore. Um, and I can't blame them because you have to keep getting up and up and up and up and it's exhausting. So um, I'm trying to put in the component of like, you get back up, you can take a beat um, and then continue forward. Uh, so, I think that's part of our community is like, yes, we have to keep going, fight, 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 fight. But up to a certain point, that's that's just not sustainable. And are we our true, authentic, happy selves or are we just angry all the time? Um, I want my community to be human and enjoy life while still fighting for the equal rights. Um, so that's why I think this mentorship, the different generational things is great because Again, it's like the changing of the guards. We have the older activists in the forefront. And now we have the younger generation that's going to step up um, and take over, which is going to be a big component of that. Thank you, thank you, Ash, for that for that answer because it is, it is definitely a great supplement to the to the very comprehensive answer that Leandro gave. Right, obviously. Uh, there are certain components of, resili of resilience, but also um, you have to honor the pain as well. Uh, you have to honor the pain of the community, your own personal pain, um, you know, uh, not to quote the fault in our stars, but, you know, the, the pain demands to be felt. Um, so I, I definitely uh, thank you for highlighting uh, that aspect of community resilience and what it means. Um, I, I definitely, you know, don't don't want to stay so much on 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 studying or, or or defining a lot of a lot of these things. I, I I want to get a lot to the best practices that you know we have as providers and as leaders in the community because a lot of the participants that are joining us are also um, you know providers and they're looking for ways to also engage their own communities. So um, my second question would be, 
also connected to community re community resilience. How is it that uh, we nurture that community resilience and those connections in order to promote leadership? Because you know, like like Ash was mentioning a little bit, it is very important that you know that that pain can become too much, and that's why we always have to rely on the newer generations to sort of carry the work that we do, right? So, um, how is it that we um, nurture these community connections in order to promote leadership? Uh, I want to start with Ash this time. I would say, hopefully, my dog doesn't bark again, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, no promises. Uh, um, so yeah, how uh, could you repeat the question? Because my little dog. Yeah, no, of course, of course, of course. Uh, how is it that we nurture community connections in order to promote um, leadership? Mm. Well, just hearing the word nurture, and at least the way I like to be seen or or do my own leadership, I try to be as personal as possible and have that, you know, family authentic care with my team. Um, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican through and through. And, you know, that cariño is always with me anywhere. You know, um, uh, when I go into meetings with guys in suits and they stick out their hand, I'm ready for a hug. Um, yeah. So I think, I think just the little, new, those little nuances of, I have to be vulnerable for my team. Uh, I want my team to see me mess up. I want to learn from my team. Um, and I also want to build them up as well. And this is my therapeutic recreation brain happening, but I like to do activities that don't have to do with what we're you know working on. Uh, because when you bond outside of work and you know the things you need to do to be a human, those are when those connections and those trust and those happy memories really set in and build. And then when you tackle the big work, you already have that, you know, you have that flow going. Um, so I think it doesn't need to be as difficult as I think some people might uh, believe it to be. I just think having, try to build genuine connections and, and relationships with the people you're working with can just do wonders um, than any training that you can probably, you know, throw them in for an hour. Um, if you know who you're working with and you know them as a person, a person outside of, you know, their role, then it, it just leads for better conversation. It's, just, it's a better flow. It's a better atmosphere. When people are comfortable, then that's when things get done better. Um, yeah. So for me, it's more, it's more mushy, so I, that's <laughs> how I go about it. More mushy, more love. Like I'd like to break, break. I want to flatten the hierarchy as much as I can, um, so it's not, you know, this dynamic of um, the fear distance between me and someone else, and or my my bosses with me as well. Um, so that's yeah. I just gotta give everybody hugs, you know. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that answer, Ash, because, um, yeah, this is sort of connected to some of the things that we were talking yesterday. You know, we want to inject that human factor to whatever it is that we're doing. You know, we never want to um, treat people like uh, you are meeting a network or you're seeing them as a number. You know, you definitely want to sort of engage them as humans. So um, thank you for highlighting that. Uh, Leandro, I want to hear from you now uh, on this one. Uh, how is it that we nurture community connections in order to promote leadership? So I, I guess three things that I want to say about this. Um, the first thing is there is a binary out there that states uh, and I'm not going to say whether that is good or right or right or wrong, um, but there's a binary out there that states that in leadership, there's two kinds of people, those who lead and those who follow. So they're leaderships and followers. Um, well, I'm not going to say that that is good or bad. I, I do want to invite us to, to, to maybe look at, a, at that binary from a different perspective and a different lens. Because in following, there is leadership. When you follow instructions, you are exercising leadership. When you are supporting a leader, you are exercising leadership. And that is to say, 
I bring this binary to say that everyone is a leader. Everyone has the capacity for, for leadership. Um, and I think oftentimes we, we kind of like construct this archetype of what a leader is. Um, and I hear oftentimes, well, I'm very introverted. Or I'm very shy. I cannot be a leader. And those are limiting conversations that in order for nurturing community connections, we have to dismantle those, those limiting connections. Because in your silence, in your shyness, in your introvertedness, you can be a leader. You can be impacting um, your community, your family, your lover, your, you know, you are impacting folks. So that's the, per the first point that I think we need to understand that everyone has the capacity to be a leader and everyone is a leader. Um, the second thing that I want to say in regards to nurturing to those who embrace more visible leadership roles, uh, either because uh, that's part of your charisma or because you're in a position where you are a leader, is the distinction that I truly believe in that leaders make leaders. Uh, you know, those talents, those resources, that memory, that um, savvy, that experience, if you go and die with all of that without sharing it, then I'm sorry, my friend, to say that your contributions in this world, you know, are limited because the only way you can maximize your contributions is to make sure that you're developing other leaders. Um, however, however that form may take, you know, uh, but if you're able to impact folks with the understanding that I have a vision and I'm going to share this vision with you all and whatever you all doing, the, however process you all adopt, that's fine because it's your process, but you are supporting the vision and thus I am creating or I'm supporting other leadership. So I think that's important uh, because oftentimes we might feel or people might feel that being a leader is just about doing it yourself and it's all about your own and, you know, it can be an ego trip. Um, and, and those things happen because we're human and that's part of our human condition, but we have to recognize it and make sure that we're sharing the space. And if we were lucky enough or we work hard enough to get a place at the table, let's make sure that we're also bringing other folks into the table as well. So that's the second distinction. Um, and I guess the third distinction to go into your question about how do we nurture those community connections to develop leadership um, and this is going to be, I'm trying how to frame this because I see that there's a lot of folks from different places. Uh, so probably my answer is going to be framed more as a New Yorker, even though I'm a born and raised Puerto Rican, <laughs> but I've, I've been, I've been 16 years in New York. So I'm a certified New Yorker, I can say, uh, but I see people from New Mexico, Alaska, Nebraska, which is great. But so I'm going to say this you have to be invested. You have to be invested in, in the community, um, however that sounds. And the reason why I started saying um, the prefix about New Yorkers is because in New York, there can be a, a, a way of thought that you are very focused, you get on the train, you are on your bike, you walk on the street, you walk on the sidewalk and you're, you know, you're going from point A from point B, don't distract me, uh, you know, and oftentimes we miss what's happening around us. And I, I guess that can be true for any place. Um, but you have to be invested. You have to make the intention decision to be invested in your community. When you see a fair on the street, stop and connect with people because that's the only way you're gonna be able to identify future leaders, to develop leaderships, to develop connections. Um, and because I could say, you know, you can start with your family and your family is part of that process. But in order to sustain the community, in order to nurture it, you have to be invested in it. You have to look for a way where it's not just from point A for point B, it's what is between the, that point A and the point B? What, what is it that I'm missing? Um, and what is it that I need to explore? And how, maybe it might, might not be things of interest, but I might discover things of interest. And that's how you nurture those connections. That's how you nurture, um, you know, and you make space for leadership to come up. Thank you. Thank you, Leandro, for that very comprehensive answer as well, because what you're saying is um, you sort of also need to maximize, you know, all the resources that you have that you sometimes don't know you have. 
<laughs> you know, like, 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 you know, they're, they are there, but you're sort of, like you said, ignoring them at times and, you know, like ignoring, in, ignoring them on purpose as well. So, um, you know, what you're saying is, you know, we need to maximize and sort of expand the vision of uh, what we see as connection. Um, so, so, so thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, this, and I, I love that you mentioned uh, a little bit of, you know, I consider myself an introvert. I think you know that. I think, you know, whoever has seen me grow in this field knows that. Um, but like, but like you said, you know, there are many ways in which we can all uh, contribute to leadership and to just community, right? So, um, we do know that leadership is often activated through these community connections and also through giving back to the community. Um, but I want to, you know, like, I, I want to hear what are some of the other ways in which uh, we found um, help, other ways we found helpful in order to be, build community leadership, you know, maybe not through connection, maybe, um, you, you know, like what are some of the unique ways in which you have found uh, we are able to build, build leadership in our community? Uh, I want to hear uh, from Leandro on this one first. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, I think, and I'm, I'm going to take an, an utopic approach here. Um, and I think I mentioned it earlier, but I think definitely investing in, in, so, so, so we talk on the first two questions about community, and I, I want to bring it down to another section of the community, which I think is family. Um, and that's why mm -hmm. I want to I take an utopic approach here. Uh, and, and I'm talking about either biological families or chosen families, which oftentimes can be as or more important uh, yeah. in the development of leadership and in development of you as an individual, because your biological family, you didn't choose. Your biological family is the one that you just, be handed to you know yeah with the goods and the wrongs and, and everything and all the spices in between but the chosen family um that's that's where you get to reflect who you are that's where you get to reflect your values that's where you get to reflect your social skills that's where you get to reflect your your capacities to love to hate to argue to interact to travel i mean the chosen family is very important and i think in order to get to community leadership, in order to, to develop that, that micro leadership, is, this is where you have to invest first. Uh, and I think as providers, um, because you mentioned that we're, we're, we're being, um, a lot of providers are coming into this call um, and as people in public health or in government or in other institutions of learning, if we don't make space for those families to, to be nurtured, to grow together, to interact, to, to train them, to develop them, we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not promoting that triggering effect that you were mentioning. Um, I think it's important for us as providers or, or people who have a platform to make sure that when we think about interventions and strategies and that we also create the safe space for that interaction to happen because it's important. Mm. I've always, in my in my years in HIV prevention, I've always been amazed about how, at least in America, the the topic or the or the or the strategy of HIV prevention has always been very individualized. Um, it's about the individual and the interventions that that a lot of us have implemented for a long time of for a, for a longer period they never include the family unit they never include a family unit they've always included at certain points the partner or the partners but the partner or the partners is just one aspect of your of, your, of that unit you know yeah. you have to bring the family unit in it as well in order for the interventions to be successful or for the individual to really feel empowered to adopt any other healthy behaviors so I think, you know, if we want to continue to trigger that, that movement, trigger that, that community leadership development, we have to invest and, and allow the spaces for those families to work together, to congregate, to educate each other. And I think, because you mentioned this before, that's my personal theory, if we allow that to happen, then that exchange of intergeneration can be, can be you know, it's seamless. That exchange is seamless. You know, um, and then you can have a youth that can be very comfortable 
interacting with an 85 year old and an 85 year old who can feel very comfortable interchanging with the youth because the family unit has allowed that for him to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you, Leandro. I think what you're mentioning also there is that, you know, we, we always talk about individuals and then the communities you know, and then the social networks, uh, uh, individuals and communities, but there's different dimensions. So what you're saying is, you know, in order for an individual to get to that level in which he's able to, or he or she or they are able to um, connect, you know, with communities, there needs to be a path towards that. And that's usually family. Uh, and we also know, you know, that um, a lot of queer um, LGBTQI plus folks do not really have that tool, you, you know, in the beginning of their lives. So they sort of have to find it, what you're mentioning, you know, the chosen family. So uh, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Ash, I want to hear also a little bit uh, more, more uh, about this uh, from you. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, for me, I, again, I, I like to, to do things simple because um, why overcomplicated? Why it, the world is already a hot mess. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's try to do a little less of that. But I think, I think when it comes from like the older and younger generation, uh, there is that big age gap that needs, you know, we need to shrink it and come together. So that way we can be that family and that family can grow and do amazing things. Um, but I think it's the responsibility of the elders to just put in, I know they've done a lot of work, but the next thing that I want them to do is to just be open and receptive to those like personal one-on-one -on -one conversations, like having someone under their wing that they can open doors for, or simply, you know, push them into doing things that the younger person didn't, wasn't even capable thought they were capable of doing um, speaking from my own experience like when I transitioned I didn't transition um, with my biological father around so navigating how to be a man was just something I had to look I had to look at media look at YouTube look at guys on the street and how they walk and I felt lost I didn't know what to do um, but I, I had uh, Dr. David Rivera who is a professor in, in Queens College, and he taught me how to like do a bow tie, um, and that was the first time. Like you know, he's a cis, he's a cis gay man, but he took that time to you know help me present myself in a way um, that I never had experience. And then he you know he gave me like grooming tips, and with that relationship, he said, "Hey, how about you do this other program with me?" And I went into his leadership program and that opened the next door for me. So it was just those simple little interactions that he, you know, took some of his time, which is extremely valuable because he's so busy and he does so much, but he gave a little bit to me to just nurture, you know, nurture me, take care of me and push me <laughs> where I didn't think I could even go. Um, and that's that's what I want the connection to see. I, I know the younger, well, speaking for myself, I know as, as a younger activist, I'm seeking like mentorship. I'm seeking leadership. I want to learn um, and I, I want to, to do better, but I have to do better for myself first. Um, and why not learn from the masters? Um, if, you know, if, if the wheel, if, if, the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, they're doing <laughs> great stuff. <laughs> Let's get it from them. Um, so yeah, I, I, I want more of that openness and it doesn't have to be like a, a, an official program in, in a clinic or a hospital or like a school setting. It could just be of your own time that you're mentoring. It doesn't have to be under a grant or anything. If you can just give a phone call or a conversation that can lead to you know, amazing things that are email check-in, like, you know, hey, what's going on and how can I help you um, here and there? And it could blossom however it, it blossoms. Um, so I, uh, you know, defer it to just be like on a simple terms and who knows, maybe someone will make a programming that, you know, ties uh, elders and young, you know, younger folks purposely together 
based off their interest or their um, professions. Um, but I think the first part would just for that we need the elders to be open and ready to embrace us because the younger ones are like we're you know are looking for it. Um, and you know, go off of what Leandro said is when you have a mentor and you build that relationship and that family, you're getting so much more. You're getting confidence, you're getting networking, you're getting more resilience, you're getting a role model. Uh, and all that can just keep propelling you forward. Um, I'm, a, I'm at the point that when I speak to my mentor, I just say, hey, can I do this thing? And she just says yes. Um, and it, it boggles my mind because when I ever, when I end up doing a program or starting an internship for trans kids, you know, it's, it's great. And all it took was for me to say, ask her if I can do it. And she said yes. So that's important too, is that we need folks that are going to believe in us and just say yes and um, be there to support us however which way it falls but at least it you know I took a shot and I think that's what a lot of youth want to do is take the shot but they're just nervous to you know who to ask and where to shoot um yeah so yeah no thank you Th thank you so much uh, Ash for the answer because what, what you mentioned is that you know this is basically a dance you know like it needs to be reciprocated like you know it's sort of like you give a little bit and I give a little bit and that's what happened with you and your professor, you know, and, and that sort of relationship, that mentorship really sort of pretty much catapulted you or like put you in this path um, that you are now, which is amazing. Uh, Leandro, I saw that you have a little bit to add to that. Yeah, because I've, I've also been following some of the chat comments, which I think is great because people are engaged. Uh, yeah. somebody, somebody mentioned that the generational gap has always existed. And I think this is where we had the opportunity to interrupt this. Uh, you Absolutely. know, I remember, I'm not gonna, this, this is part of my story. It's not meant to shade any organization. It's just gonna be part of, of my story. Um, but when I was a, a youth, a peer youth um, in one organization that I work with, um, I found it very interesting that they only have youth activities and adults activities separate. And we're talking about LGBT, the LGBT community. And while I understand that there were specific objectives that we needed to to accomplish within these two um, populations i've also felt that there was missed opportunity because i was listening i was sitting on both groups and i was listening to the concerns of the youth and i was listening to the stories of the older adults and i'm like oh my god you know there's there's a disconnect here and we're missing it and i remember bringing it up to my supervisors and they were like no no no, no they need to be separate um older adults older gay adults cannot be in the same space of youth. Yeah. Later on, I discovered that that is called institutionalized homophobia. Uh, but, you know, at that point, I didn't have that resource or I didn't understand it. Um, once I understood it, I said, no, no, I need to challenge this because while there need to be separate spaces in order to address certain things, as an agency, we had a unique opportunity to bring these two generations together and to learn from each other. So we just, what do we need to do? We just need to set guidelines and protocols about interactions and about what is this, the expectation of this space for both parties. And I realized that what, once we did it, once we were able to come bring those two communities together, the experience was amazing because the youth was able to share some of the concerns, identify mentors, as Ash was saying, uh, but also the older adults were able to transfer the knowledge, transfer the experience, transfer what it meant to be a, a, a gay activist in Puerto Rico to the younger generation, which I think was, was losing. So I think we, I appreciate Manuel what you're saying, and, and that's why we need to do this in this type of spaces, identify that philosophy and start, and start to interrupt it. Absolutely. Absolutely, I, I definitely agree with that, and and um, I, I want to mention, um, you you know, you just mentioned that that you did this in Puerto Rico. This this is definitely a great great segue for um, where we want to head this conversation. At least in the uh, last twenty minutes that we have, uh, we have two you know Puerto Rican champions with us. So we definitely want to hear your perspective on this. Um, 
because after all, this is, you know, the uh, New York City Latinx Latino uh, gay, bi, and trans men's uh, health rally. So we definitely want to hear more about um, what is the importance of visibility, mentorship, and role modeling for Latinx Latino men um, within our organizations. Because, you know, we know that this is also extremely specific um, way to approach leadership. And there, there also comes a lot of the cultural values that we have as well. So um, I want to hear from you uh, a little more on this. Um, who wants to start first? Oh, Leandro, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll start. Let's go. Um, so you mentioning visibility, mentorship, mentorship, and role modeling. So I, I think I agree with 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 two of those three. Uh, visibility is important, and mentorship is important. Visibility is important because, oh my God, as as gay, bi, and trans men, the archetype that we have to live live to is is very toxic and very dangerous. And it's, it's so oppressing and it's so, you know, it's just toxic. You know, that society's definition of what a masculine man needs to be or what masculinity is or where a man is, 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 is um, well, it's just, it's just that it's toxic. And, you know, we, visibility is important because it helps us to start fighting that toxicity. Uh, when people, when younger generations in particular are able to see diversity, are able to see, a uh, comfortable gay man being authentic to himself, not following the social constructs of, of, of anyone, just but just being authentic to itself. It brings value, it brings power. Um, and it also shows, you know, oh, there's a different alternative. You know, I don't have to be this archetype or I don't have to subject myself to, to this persona. Um, mentorship, for sure. In order for the movement to continue, in order for our our values to continue, we have to embrace mentorship. And somebody mentioned in the chat that there's different different ways of, of, of mentorship. And that is true. You know, you don't have to stick with one variety. I think I've been very privileged to identify different men. Oh, sorry, I get passionate. <laughs> That's the cue to speak slow uh, uh, for the translators. Uh, I've been very privileged to identify different mentors in my life from different perspectives and from each one I've learned. And I think, you know, I, and, and I hope that I've been a mentor to some folks and that some folks have learned from, from my mistakes or from my craziness uh, or crazy ideas, uh, because that's the only way that we as a society move forward. Um, the one that I don't agree with that much is role modeling, because I think role modeling is also a very dangerous construct, social construct. Um, I'm not looking for role models. I'm looking for someone who speak their truth and in their actions, I can, I can take from that and learn to be authentic or to be true to myself. Oftentimes, role modeling can be a very dangerous box for folks because, you know, we all come from different places, from different experience. What worked for you might not work for me. So I don't need to box you into one specific area for me to imitate. And I, I feel or I, or I sense that sometimes when we use role models is because we're trying to imitate. No, mm -hmm. I, I, and that's why I, I, I don't like that one that much. But I think that if we're able to identify people as leaders and as mentors, you absorb from them what you need, and then you develop your own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leandro, for, for that answer. Um, Ash, I definitely also want to hear uh, from you on this. How, how important are visibility and mentorship uh, for Latinx men within our organizations? Uh, it's like, it's life-changing. It can be extremely impactful to walk into a space that's <clears throat> offering support and knowing that not only are you going to be safe, but you're going to be affirmed and you're going to be seen. Um, because that puts a, as a trans man, that's a huge weight that we all carry every day is, you know, checking ourselves there. Are, are we, did we do this right? Or are they treating us well? Or, you know, we're always hyper analyzing everything because that's how our survival brain works where we need to just be like our heads on a swivel 
But when you go into a space that you feel safe and you can just like relax, um, let the guard down and actually open up and be vulnerable about, you know, your sexual health or your mental health and things that you're concerned about, it can change someone's life. Um, versus if you don't feel firm there, you're probably not going to want to get tested with a place that uh, makes you feel unsafe or, you know, misgenders you, wrong pronouns, you know, things like that can really just shut someone down for valid reasons. You know, it's a historical um, uh, way of oppression and discrimination. Um, and I know for me personally, I started transitioning when I was 21. Um, for me, I feel like that's rather late. Uh, but if I had seen like a trans man or a trans any any trans person in a clinic or a doctor or in some type of um, support groups that I was going to at the time, I would have been aware that this was a thing and like explored it and um, you know transitioned a little bit earlier in my life um, because it took me up to twenty one to to even know what trans was um, because there wasn't a lot of visibility and there there wasn't a lot of people I can see. Um, and especially with it being Latinx, like I, I didn't know any trans Latino men, like, yeah. and when I went to, um, I think the first support group I went to was in the center. Um, and it was, it was a support group with like a whole bunch of trans men. And that, that was the first time I was saw like all different types of trans men. But the one thing they had in common was they were white. Um, so now I'm going in there, this little trans baby from the south bronx <laughs> and i'm trying to commute you know trying to figure out who i am but also integrate myself in this very like white space it was kind of like a culture shock um and i couldn't talk to them about certain things like how do i do my hair or like how do you style the beard is it too coarse you know it, those little nuances um really play a, a role and uh it's important that you know you you can you can be as authentic as you can you know for your for all types of health your mental your physical your sexual health um because in that vulnerability is you know when you are taking care of yourself the most so it's extremely extremely important to have that visibility there and like anywhere everywhere because i think someone around the chat they're like yeah we are so different and we're not always going to hit all the marks, um, but the more diversity, you know, at least we're going to hit a, a, a lot more than before. Thank you, thank you, Ash, for uh, for sharing, and and I definitely want to thank you for um, putting that personal, um, you, you know, insight in 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 all the answers that you have given because you're right, you know, like like you mentioned, visibility, mentorship, they can be life changing and. Um, uh, I, I think your your particular lived experience is definitely one of the examples, you know, like like you mentioned. Um, I want to direct the conversation also a little bit, you know, because obviously we have discussed the very unique challenges that we have as Latinx queer men um, in this field, uh, especially, you know, but but also as Latinx men who are providers, you know, like we we do know that we want to mentor so many people you know we want to connect with all these people but the resources as we know is are not always there right so um how does one tackle the challenges of serving latinx gay bi and or trans men when the funding is not always there you know and and when it is there for example it's not allocated to community-based organizations but in most cases to clinics you know who have a plethora of funding or when it's community-based organizations it can be you know some perhaps more white centric uh, community based organizations like like ash just mentioned a, a little bit so I, I want to i want to hear how is it that uh, you guys have been able to tackle this particular challenges in your um, in your work. Uh, I want to hear from Leandro first on this one. Okay, you just you just extend this for an hour <laughs> with that question, uh, but I'll keep it short because I know that there's some questions in the chat that we want to handle. Yep. Um, we have to be resilient. We have to be resilient. We have to hold the funders and the fundees accountable. 
Um, you know, I think we are in an environment where things are changing. Um, and if funds are being given to a certain, you know, not, not to throw shade on clinics because we have wonderful partners in clinics. Uh, yeah. But I am concerned because oftentimes the clinic world operates in such a very structured format and they have to operate that way because there's so many regulations that they have to follow that one questions, you know, will, they be, will, will, will this funding in a clinic be a space where a trans man and trans person, a gay man or gay, can actually navigate other areas that are not just medical related. Um, and I think this is where we have to hold them accountable, you know, um, but also hold the funder accountable. If, if, if the funding, if the funder sees that the only needs that need to be addressed is only the medical, but not the other piece of it, then we need to hold them accountable as well. And this is where as a community, we have to show our resilience, we have to mobilize, we have to advocate, we have to uh, write letters, we have to sign letters, we have to write petitions, distribute petitions and get involved uh, because that's the only way. And, but, this, th but this part of, of, of community mobilization this is where our older our elders will teach us, you know, how to mobilize. And this yeah. is where the, the younger generation can step in and say, okay, I can take this and now use social media as a platform to really, you know, bring this into subject. But this is a perfect example of how the two generations can work together. But definitely we do have to mobilize and, and be active in, in holding the funder and, and, and the people accountable. Thank you, thank you, Leandro, for for highlighting that last part. You know, the intergenerational synergy, like you said. You know, we forget sometimes that these paths have been have been crossed, have been walked, and we just need to ask for the map at times. Um, Ash, I want to hear from you on this one as well. How is it that you know at Alifourni, uh, you guys have been able to really keep working with these communities, perhaps you know, like with the lack of funding at times. Uh, what, well, what Leandro said, 100%. Um, but there also, you have to be, you have to be strategic and you have to uh, be kind of uh, accommodating. So if funding is being used for one, one specific pipeline, there has to be some wording in there that we can kind of like poke a hole and drift some of it, you know, to a needed area. Um, and it's not that we're doing anything wrong. It's just kind of shifting it over. Um, creative, getting creative. <laughs> exactly. Like if, uh, if we have funding for, uh, for, you know, our, our game, our gay men to be, tr uh, tested for HIV and they offer us like the testing kits and condoms and such uh okay well i can get these trans men who are men and i can put them in that you know where you know they they can also get hiv tested where you know funding for the trans uh men were not if we typically is usually cis men and trans women are at the forefront of hiv and, and testing and such and the trans men kind of like flow in this in between I guess they think we don't have sex, um, but we're still vulnerable to it. So my idea was, well, these are still men and the men can get tested, you know, and that's how that works. So it's just a reallocating um, of some of those resources. Um, and as far as, you know, other partnerships that are uh, like when you have no funding and you, there's other partners that you do have, it's kind of like, you know, I do you a favor, you do me a favor. If you have an abundance of supplies and you want to get your name out there, let me table with your supplies and hand it out. Um, and that way I share your amazing work and how it aligns with our amazing work and it's a teamwork there. You know, you want to uh, kind of identify how you can help your partner and, and not make it harder for them. And then that relationship can be beneficial both ways, especially when you didn't have none to begin with. Um, and like lastly, the, the one that I do the most is when you have no funding, nothing to shift around, you're by yourself, no partners, you have to really kind of like bootstrap it. You just might, not have funding for a while you might not have you know be getting paid for the work that you're doing 
Um, right now, I'm trying to start an internship for trans people at BCC, uh, Bronx Community College, and I'm not getting a penny for it. We have no money towards it, but we have an amazing connection with um, Oasis that said, yeah, we need the help, and we have these amazing students that we can bring to you. Um, so that right there, and we're still enriching those students and giving them the opportunity to grow and develop and network and be in touch with these amazing people that, hey, they look like you and they get it. Um, but it it's just kind of like, it, you if you really do this work, I think a lot of activists do, you kind of cultivate so much love that, you know, you, these little passion projects just kind of poke out at you. Yeah. And um, I think that's important just to, just to be aware it might just be, uh, free for now and so someone picks it up and you know can back it up but it's still, it still works <laughs> <laughs> no no thank you thank you ash because yeah you're right like you know what we do in this work is also that you know get creative find find new ways uh to reach that community make those connections uh so so thank you for uh for highlighting that. Um, we are at the five minute mark. So uh, I, I definitely want to get to some of the questions that we have in the Q&A, but I also want to uh, remind our participants to please complete the evaluation link that Luciano is currently sharing on the chat. Um, just, you know, help us with whatever feedback you might have uh, and just, you know, what is it that you want us to talk about next? Um, so thank you for, for completing the, that evaluation. I, I want to get to the questions now, uh, since we have a little bit more than uh, four minutes. Uh, the first question that I want to tackle is uh, Diego Huerta's uh, question, which is, if we want to host a weekend retreat for skills building and leadership training for clients, what should we make sure to include? We want to nurture our group during this time. I definitely want to ask our panelists to keep, you know, answers short a little bit because of time, but um, Leandro? Sure, as someone who has implemented a thousand retreats, <laughs> <laughs> in this field, I think it's important, uh, Diego, to first of all, understand, the, be intentional. What is the intention behind the retreat? Um, um, and while you might have an idea of what it is that you want to put forward and you have a vision, it's also it, 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 well, it works well to hear from the community as well. What will make it worth it for them to take their time to go into a retreat? And from there, look for ways that you can align what they want with what the vision that you want to implement. Number two, it's, 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 it's a great idea for retreats to look for a way for congregation to happen because it might be the first time where those participants have the opportunity to meet in an alternative space outside of a bar, outside of a club, outside of work. You are allowing those participants to come to a safe space to really be themselves. So make sure that the retreat agenda is not packed back to back, back to back, but that there's the space of community building there. And then a third one, which is always my favorite for retreats is allow a space for storytelling. Storytelling is powerful. Storytelling uh, moves. And when you have someone from the community sharing their story, whatever the story it is, it does resonate. It has a domino effect. Thank you. Ash, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, you know, it's always hard going after uh, Leandro because <laughs> they say a lot so eloquently. Um, but I'll just I'll piggyback off of what they said because I agree like full heart heartedly. Um, there definitely can be some structure in play, um, but my recreation heart always goes to you know have those team building activities that you know can be fun and and different and you can really see who's creative and who actually will take a step back and take a step forward and um, you know have those enjoyable moments that they can recall recall when you know things are a little hectic um i think that shows a lot of strength and just builds and it's also nourishing because if we look at leisure especially like in um underserved communities or populations like lgbt or you know uh people of color leisure is a privilege you know a lot of us don't get to experience that uh it's you know we are very much work 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 
And if you get to play and enjoy yourself, you actually might be seen as lazy or, you're, you know, you should be working. Um, so when I do my trainings, I love to just give that kind of casual uh, time for the participants to, you know, engage with each other in a more casual, um, enjoyable way. Um, and if there is time, you know, in between uh, the trainings, I, I implement that, whether it's like snack time or, you know, a fun game here and there. So they can like wind down and, you know, not be boggled by all the information that they're getting. And at the same time, you're giving them something that they probably haven't had in a week. Like they probably hadn't laughed <laughs> with a whole bunch of people. Um, and that's, uh, can last, can leave a lasting impression, you know, they're going to carry that forward. Um, so that's how I like to go about it. Just kind of fun. It can, learning can be fun, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> No, I mean, that's a, that's a great, uh, great way to really end uh, our webinar, you know, like, uh, it, it is true, you know, you know, our communities also, they want to have fun and, and you know, connecting is so much fun, uh, talking to people and also just um, really sharing stories, like Leandro was saying, you know, like, it, it is, it is really, really um, nurturing to hear those, those stories from, from folks. Um, again, now, uh, we are at we are at 2 p.m. So uh, I, before we go, I want to make sure to thank our panelists uh, for, for joining us today. Ash, thank you so much for joining us. And Leandro, thank you so much also as well. I know that you mentioned that, you know, you don't know if, you know, some of them, if you've been able to mentor someone, trust me, I've been mentored by you and I consider you one of my mentor, like always and forever. So uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, and I also want to thank our, our participants for, for joining us today. Uh, again, make sure to you know, check that evaluation link and uh, thank you Luciano and Michael for all the logistical work and uh, we will be seeing you on the next one. Thank you for making this rally a successful one. Take care everyone.